morning. Welcome to St. Andrews. Please stand for our opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess. Pray for me to the Lord. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, whom, taught by the Holy Spirit, we dare to call our Father, 
Bring, we pray, to perfection in our hearts the spirit of adoption as your sons and daughters, that we may merit to enter into the inheritance which you have promised. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. A reading from the first book of Kings. Elijah went a day's journey into the desert until he came to a broom tree and sat beneath it. He prayed for death, saying, This is enough, O Lord. Take my life, for I am no better than my father's. He lay down and fell asleep under the broom tree. But then an angel touched him and ordered him to get up and eat. Elijah looked, and there at his head was a hearth cake and a jug of water. After he ate and drank, he lay down again. But the angel of the Lord came back a second time, touched him, and ordered, Get up and eat, else the journey will be too long for you. He got up, ate, and drank. Then, strengthened by that food, he walked forty days and forty nights to the mountain of God, Horeb. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were sealed for the day of redemption. All bitterness, fury, anger, shouting, and reveling must be removed from you, along with all malice. And be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving one another, as God has forgiven you in Christ. So be imitators of God as beloved children, and live in love as Christ loved us and handed himself over for us as a sacrificial offering to God for a fragrant aroma. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. The Jews murmured about Jesus because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph? Do, do we not know his, his father and, and mother? Then, then how can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered and said to, him, to them, Stop murmuring among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draw him. And I, am, and I will raise him on the last day. It is written in the prophets, They shall all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to my Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I am the living bread, come down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning. We, again, are in the, in, the, in the midst of the Bread of Life discord where we hear over and over and over again Jesus say these words, I am the Bread of Life, I am the Living Bread, I am the Bread from Heaven, right? Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Repetition, 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 right? We have to continue to engage and enter into that conversation and that prayer to encounter Christ over and over and over again as he tells us the same thing. He drills it into us. And so it's also what we are called to do, what we're doing right now, what I am attempting to do. As I said at the very beginning of the Bread of Life discourse, I want to kind of go through the different aspects of, of, of the Eucharist. In particular, the reality of, of, of the Eucharist being a meal. There are multiple dimensions and, and, and depth. There are so many things surrounding the Eucharist and the Mass. You know, this Mass is sacrifice, right? But it also is a table. It's a meal. And Christ is at the center of that meal. You know, two weeks ago we talked about how we prepare for a meal. Now for Mass, Eucharist, we prepare by fasting, an hour, by only consuming water and, and, and medicine. How we, we examine our conscience. So we say, oh, am, I, am I in the state of grace? Am I in full communion? Am I in mortal sin? Do I need to go to confession? Do I need to come talk to a priest? What do I need to do to prepare my heart for the Lord? Am I disposed to the graces? We prepare for the meal. What is the meal? Well, we talked about last week. The meal is Jesus Christ. The meal is Jesus Christ. Body, blood, soul, and divinity. Do we believe in the real presence? Again, when we come forward and the minister, myself or the extraordinary minister says, body of Christ, we say amen. Yes, truly, I believe it. That is the body of Christ. It's more than a symbol, but is Jesus Christ. Today I want to talk about why. Why do we receive this meal? Why do we come to this table to partake of our Lord? I thought, you know what? Let's go to the catechism. I'm not going to read the catechism word for word. I am going to pull some things out of the catechism, right? But I'm pulling particularly from the 10 paragraphs at the end of the section about the Eucharist, the fruits of Holy Communion. There are 
paragraphs 1391 to 1401. If you ever read the catechism or looked at the catechism, it's not split up by page number, it's split up by paragraph number. So it's easier to find things. But there are four, four or five. I think the fifth thing that they express as a fruit is actually tied into the other two of the, of the other fruits. But there are four fruits that I want to go over and a fifth that I want to touch on that we hear about in the catechism. If you ever read the catechism, you'll notice sometimes that certain words or phrases are in italics. Are in italics. That's their way of saying, pay close attention to these words, their significance. First, the Holy Communion augments our union with Christ. This should be apparent. This should be obvious, right? We become what we eat. We eat Jesus. He becomes a part of us. But this is the principal fruit of receiving the Eucharist in Holy Communion. That's what the Catechism says. The Catechism says it's the principal fruit of receiving the, Holy, the Eucharist in Holy Communion is an intimate union with Jesus Christ, with Christ Jesus, right? There is nothing more intimate than the Eucharist when it comes to relationship with Jesus. The most intimate encounter with Christ is through receiving communion, praying in his presence. It is the principal fruit of Holy Communion. That is why we're here. Intimacy and union with Christ. He goes on to say that the communion is, is communion with the flesh of Jesus, but not just any flesh, the risen flesh of Christ. That the body, blood, soul, and divinity that is present in the Eucharist is the resurrected Jesus, glorified and risen Lord. Then when we receive that life, Holy Spirit through the Eucharist, it preserves, increases, and renews the life of grace received at baptism. That in baptism we are washed clean. We become children of God. We receive that sanctifying grace. And it is the Eucharist that preserves, increases, and renews that grace of baptism. That, that the, this growth in Christian life needs the nourishment of the Eucharistic communion, the bread for our pilgrimage until the moment of death, when it will be given to us as viaticum. Viaticum just means communion at death. And there is a few things as beautiful that I've encountered in my time as a priest in giving someone communion on their deathbed. And seeing the peace and the strength and the, the fortitude that it brings at the time of death. But the reality of the Eucharist nourishing the life that has begun in baptism. I'm reminded again of our first reading of Elijah. Elijah is, is going on a journey as he did most of his life. And he's, he, he's exhausted and he, he sits down and falls asleep under this broom tree, right? And the angel appears to him and thunks him on the head. Elijah, here, eat this water, eat this, drink this water, eat this bread. Yeah, he eats it. And he goes back to sleep. And then, and then the angel says, no, wake up. Get up, eat and drink. The journey is long. And it says he got up, sustained by the food that he ate, and walked 40 days and 40 nights. That is our pilgrimage. This life is our pilgrimage. It's our journey through the desert. And the desert is treacherous. It is hard. It is exhausting. It is, there are things in the desert that want to destroy us. It is the Eucharist that sustains us. Nourishes us. Give us strength. For that pilgrimage of life. And ultimately prepares us. For our moment of death, whether it be planned, expected, or sudden.
So first and principal fruit is communion, union, intimacy with Christ. The second is that Holy Communion separates us from sin. We've talked about this a little bit before in the previous homily. It separates us from sin, right? Just as bodily, flu- bodily nourishment restores lost strength for our body, so the Eucharist strengthens our charity. That Christ in the Eucharist is the living charity of Christ. And that living charity wipes away venial sins. Again, wipes away venial sins is in italics. Special emphasis that venial sin is washed, wiped away. We receive the living charity of Christ in the Eucharist. And that, that same charity that is enkindled in us preserves us from future mortal sins. Again, preserves us from future mortal sins. Special emphasis, that's italicized. That if we are struggling with a particular mortal sin or a particular grave sin, the Eucharist is our source of strength and our protection to preserve us in that battle. Now, if we find ourselves fallen to that mortal sin, You know, the Eucharist, that same paragraph says, the Eucharist is not ordered to the forgiveness of mortal sins. That is proper to the sacrament of reconciliation. But the Eucharist, Eucharist is proper to the sacrament of those who are in full communion with the church. So we find ourselves not in full communion. We find ourselves in in grave sin and mortal sin. Then we go to confession. We reconcile and enter into that fullness so that we can receive that nourishment. And the Lord desires us to receive that. What did we hear in our gospel, right? No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draw him. I recognize there may be someone in this church or other churches throughout the, the world and the country and the state and the diocese that there are many who can't, for whatever reason, receive communion. The Lord is drawing you into that. Is giving you grace at every Mass to say, To have the courage to say, I need to reconcile this. Give that desire. Draw us closer to himself. Again, the first is to to augment that union with Christ. To strengthen, to deepen that union with Christ. So that he can preserve us from sin, both venial and mortal. The third is the unity of the mystical body. Eucharist makes the church. This is tied in with the first one, right? Because every time we receive communion, we enter deeper into that relationship and unity with Christ. And through Christ, we enter into unity with one another. That each and every one of us, when we engage and unite ourselves to Christ, we become one through Christ. That's the church. The mystical body of Christ. How many times over the last year and a half have we heard that that phrase, we're stronger together. We're stronger together. We're in this together, right? I mean, I just heard it this last Friday when we were were at our, our principal pastor conference or meeting, day workshop. And Janet Eden, who is awesome, is our superintendent for Catholic schools, Said this, she was she was gave a very convicting state of uh, uh, presentation about how we're losing our kids. We are failing our kids by not teaching them the faith, and I'm I'm talking explicitly through the education process. Are we forming young men and women in Christ? And she said, we together can can move toward greater conversion of our children. Instead of trying to become these silos where we try to take on the world or, or whatever by ourselves. But it is through Christ that we become one. Not through some program or a positive mental energy. Christ is what brings us together. Christ is the source of unity. That unity is found through, through Christ in the Eucharist. That is how we become stronger. 
become one. If you have struggles with your Catholic brother or sister, bring that to the Eucharist. So that the Lord can heal that division. So, principal fruit, union with Christ. Second, separation from sin, preserve us from venial mortal sin. Unity in the mystical body. And fourth, the Eucharist commits us to the poor. That what we receive, the love of Christ here at church, it's not meant to stay with us here at church. It's meant to, we're meant to carry that into the world, to our homes, to our places of recreation, to our workplaces, to anybody and everybody that we encounter, the poor of the world. And when I say poor, I do not just mean naturally or materially poor. How many people in the world are suffering from a spiritual poverty? They're starving for something more. And the Eucharist is that bread that is meant to sustain that, that starvation. I heard a quote, again, Janet Eaton said, Christ is the, is the, the remedy for every Ill, human ill and the solution for every human problem. Are we bringing, are we taking Jesus into the world Our fifth one that, it, that the catechism has, it's not really, a, it doesn't really state it as a fruit, but it, it's more a, an observation in, in, in the Eucharist and the unity of Christians that there's a woundedness in the church because we have so many of our brothers and sisters, right? Our separated brethren. People who we share a common belief in, in, in Christ and the resurrection. Yet our, we, many of our Protestant brothers and sisters, our non-denominational Christians, do not believe in the Eucharist. And that breaks the Lord's heart. Because He wants us all to believe. To be able to stand, before, stand here and say, Amen, yes, truly, that is the body of Christ. Receive it well. And so going into, actually that ties into the poor, you know, commitment to the poor and to the mystical body. That we have a responsibility that's a part of our job as brothers and sisters in Christ, as members of the mystical body, is to seek healing in the mystical body. That all Christians may be one. Christ. That all who are baptized are called, are drawn to the Eucharist. These are the fruits, the main fruits we see and we believe about the Eucharist. Why wouldn't we want to eat and partake of this meal? That's the beauty of the gift that God has given us. Every time we receive communion, we draw closer to Christ, greater intimacy. He washes away venial sin and protects us and preserves us against mortal sin. He strengthens and unites the body of Christ and gives us strength and courage to take him out into the world. That is why we go to communion. That is why we receive Holy Communion. That is what we believe when we say amen, yes, truly, that is the body of Christ. That is why Christ is the center of this holy meal. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth.
Let us offer our prayers and petitions to our Heavenly Father. For all baptized in the church, may the Holy Spirit aid us in our Im imitation of Christ's sacrificial love and forgiveness. Let us pray to the Lord. For the nation, may the Holy Spirit guide us to true healing and authentic truth. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who are serving in governments and civic leadership, may the Lord give them hearts of compassion and wisdom. Let us pray to the Lord. For those overwhelmed by life's circumstances and difficulties, may the peace of Christ bring them relief and consolation. Let us pray to the Lord. For each of us here, may the Lord help us grow in compassion toward one another. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who have died, may they soon bask in the eternal light of the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. For the petitions written in our parish prayer book, the protection of all those who are serving their country, being deceased members of the Buckley family, and all intentions we now pause to pray. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord. Heavenly Father, we offer you these petitions and we ask that in your love you may grant them according to your holy will. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands will become for us the bread of life. Blessed 
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Through the vine and work of human hands will become our spiritual drink. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Be pleased, O Lord, to accept the offerings of your church, for in your mercy you have given them to be offered, and by your power you transform them into the mystery of our salvation. Through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For we know it belongs to your boundless glory that you came to the aid of mortal beings with your divinity and even fashioned for us a remedy out of mortality itself that the cause of our downfall might become the means of our salvation through Christ our Lord. Through him, the hosts of angels adore your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. May our voices, we pray, join with theirs in one chorus of exultant praise as we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins, this in memory of me.
a mystery of faith. Therefore, Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Andrew, St. Francis, Savior, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, and Carl, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters and to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow in the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant our peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Lord be with you always. Let's offer each other a sign of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb.
Say, Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. And be our protection against the wickedness and the of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits, prowl about the world, seeking the Let us pray. May the communion in your sacrament that we have consumed save us, O Lord, and confirm us in the light of your truth through Christ our Lord. Two quick things. Next Sunday, a couple of things, awesome things are happening. Next Sunday uh, is the third Sunday of the month, which we started this summer uh, having donuts. So we have donuts and coffee next, next Sunday. I tell you this now so that you can plan ahead for it. So, uh, and we're doing that over at the cafeteria uh, where we can spread out, but also have a little uh, fellowship and communion. Next weekend is also, next Sunday is also the Assumption, the Assumption of Mary to Heaven, which is a holy day of obligation, which means if it were on a Thursday, you would need to go to Mass on a Thursday. This year, though, we get a twofer, you know, uh, because the assumption, it lands on a Sunday. So that coming to Mass next Sunday, for one Mass, you can get fulfill two obligations. The obligation for Sunday and the obligation for the assumption. So it's very exciting. But that weekend is kind of the Mary's weekend. And so, uh, as I said last week, and I, I think we actually have some bulletins in the back. We printed more bulletins this week because we ran out last week. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, Scott Watts. I went to seminary with. He works for Hope for the Poor, which they do ministry to the poor in, in predominantly Mexico City. He's going to come and give a very beautiful talk Saturday night and Sunday night um, on Our Lady Guadalupe, on the image, the history, the devotion. Uh, I've, I've had multiple conversations with him. He's very well versed. He's an awesome man. Um, he's going to have a, a life-size uh, replica of the image. It's going to be very beautiful. I need. Um, we're going to do it after Mass on Saturday. And then at 5 o'clock, I'm, I'm wanting to have some, some volunteers to bring some food. Maybe we can have a potluck type thing. Um, so at 5 o'clock, we can share a meal together and then, and then have, of course, the talk, another talk on Our Lady Guadalupe. So um, there's a bulletin, English on one side, Spanish on the other, um, poster in the bulletin. And then, of course, on the doors, there's and the, the bulletin board. So please prayerfully discern showing up. If you can't come both nights, come one night. Come one night. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace glorifying the Lord by your life.